Um, I'm Arlene Berman. I'm in the Department of Psychology at Carnegie Mellon University, and I'm an affiliated faculty in the Center for the Neural Basis of Cognition, a joint institute between Carnegie Mellon and the University of Pittsburgh. And one of the um, persistent controversies or ongoing controversies in the field of visual neuroscience concerns the regions of cortex that subserve the human ability to recognize objects as efficiently and, and as accurately as we do. Um, it's been um, an elusive uh, topic up until now and people have struggled to be able to identify the neural substrate that supports object recognition. In this particular study we had the unique opportunity to examine um, the brain of an individual who is impaired at object recognition. Um, this is a very rare kind of individual. He suffers from a deficit known as visual agnosia. The term agnosia refers to the inability to recognize objects. It comes from the Greek meaning a without and gnosis meaning knowledge. And in particular, it seems as though he's lost the ability to have visual knowledge specifically from the, the visual system. So f as an example, if you show him um, an object or a picture, he may not know what it is or he makes, may make some kind of error. For example, I showed him a picture of a harmonica and he called it a cash register. So he's not blind, um, but nevertheless, he fails to recognize visual objects. Importantly, it's not because he can't see, and it's also not because he doesn't know what a harmonica is. The visual stimulus fails to be processed by the brain in such a way that it can access the meaning from that visual um, construct, from the visual percept. So this is a unique individual who has this unique and rare uh, visual deficit. And our goal was to try and identify what has gone wrong in his brain such that we would then be able to understand what are the circuits or the pathways or the regions of the brain that are needed to enable normal object recognition. Um, we conducted extensive behavioral studies as well as um, neural investigations using MRI, um, which means we were able to plot out those regions of the brain that were active while he was recognizing objects, um, as well as um, we were able to map out very carefully exactly which regions had been affected by the lesion. So we had very good structural images, knowing exactly which regions of the brain were defunct, and we looked at what was happening in the brain while he was performing object recognition tasks. Well, unsurprisingly, we found that in the region of the lesion, there was not a lot going on. That part of the brain is just not working. Um, what was perhaps the most dramatic and controversial and counterintuitive result was that um, while the lesion was in the right hemisphere and was actually circumscribed and really quite small, so dramatically a very small lesion can essentially knock out the ability to do object recognition. But in parallel we found that the same region but in the structurally intact left hemisphere was also not operating normally. So there are very remote and distal effects associated with even a circumscribed lesion. And in some ways, this has made us and perhaps other people in the field step back a little and have to rethink the way we understand the relationship between brain and behavior. Because while in the past we might have said, this is the lesion, and his behavior is impaired, and so the impairment must be because of this lesion. Now we see that the lesion has more comprehensive and widespread effects in other parts of the brain. And so we need to understand and we need to think, we need to take into account the fact that there are multiple parts of the brain potentially that underlie object recognition. And a lesion to any one of those parts can essentially impair, uh, decrease the ability to do normal object recognition. 
one of the reasons I think that we've been able to do this kind of study is because in the last couple of years um, there's been a collaborative endeavor by many neuroscientists in Pittsburgh to put together a registry of potential patients who'd be willing to participate in, in research. This is a joint endeavor between the University of Pittsburgh and CMU. I think what we would also like to do if we had the opportunity, would be to um, take an individual whose lesion was now in the left hemisphere. The patient uh, who we studied has a lesion in the right hemisphere and we see this corresponding effect in the structurally intact left hemisphere. It really would be ideal to be able to do the sort of mirror reverse of that experiment and take a patient with a lesion in the left hemisphere hopefully, you know, ideally in the same region and see what the impact is in the right hemisphere. This will help us understand whether the right hemisphere really is dominant and it can inhibit the left hemisphere, as we saw in this particular case, or whether the hemispheres are equipotential, contributing equally, so that we would also see suppression of the right hemisphere following a left hemisphere lesion. So I think this gives us a unique window into the neural substrate of object recognition and in fact has made us rethink and reconsider what the neural substrate of object recognition really is. But there are many steps that are still to be taken before we can definitively understand the system.